To some people, divine providence created the countryside, and the city is the profane creation of man. Some regard cities as ugly, soul-destroying, grasping and pitiless. But other eyes see splendor in cities, massive, towering achievements, exciting in their busy affairs, functional and disorderly, but beautiful in their way. A renowned citizen of a hallowed city, Socrates of Athens said, fields and trees teach me nothing, but the people in a city do. People are a city, not the ferries, trains and buses, not the shop windows and office blocks, the drainage, the elevators, delivery trucks and kilowatts of electricity. People make a city. And in this city of Sydney, capital of New South Wales, the senior state of the great Southland, Australia, there are millions of people. A city is its people, not its physical dimensions, nor its geographical location, not its material objects, nor statistics. People give the city its character. The people build a city to furnish the necessities for living and working, for transferring produce and manufactures from maker to consumer and seller to buyer, for organizing the public services a numerous modern community must have. Without people, all this complex structure has no life. The people of Sydney, more than two million of them have built a metropolis covering 670 square miles on the eastern seaboard of their continent, lapped by the waves of the Pacific Ocean. They take an agreeable climate so much for granted that they begin to complain if they have more than two consecutive days of rain or cold. This vigorous, always moving city is one of the few in the world using a closed circuit television system and a network of traffic lights to regulate and speed the movement of traffic through its heart. How fast the flitting figures come. The mild, the fierce, the stony face. Some bright with thoughtless smiles and some where secret tears have left their trace. These struggling tides of life that seem in wayward, aimless course to tend are eddies of the mighty stream that rolls to its appointed end. In the bustling city, there remains a touch of old worldliness. But the rotund wagoner and his imperturbable horse must wait while the policeman listens to someone's problem. All the other horses are compressed within the steel bonnets of automobiles. The city is the center of a thousand trades. In just one of the city's banks, deft fingers and swift machines process 150,000 checks a day or more than three million checks a month. Australians are the world's greatest users of checks, after the Americans. Sydney women make textiles. The cloth they weave is woven from Australian wool, the best in the world. 
nimble hands assemble the delicate wiring in advanced switching mechanisms which enable any telephone user in Sydney to call any number in Perth, 2,000 miles on the other side of Australia, or in the cities in between. As a direct dialing, long-distance service spreads from one end of the continent to the other. Telephones bright and sleek for an unceasing domestic demand. Sydney also makes telephones for other countries. Here is part of an export shipment of 20,000 handsets, an order worth a million in money. Pulse of the city's commercial life and the gauge of its investment opportunities, Sydney's Stock Exchange, almost a hundred years old, is a market where three quarters of a million stocks and shares are traded on an average day. Sydney's part of the automobile industry includes an assembly line for Australia's own car, the Holden. Not only does the Holden dominate the home market, it is exported to many countries. To its older manufacturers, Sydney has recently added petrochemicals, plastics, oil refining and electronic equipment. If it's wanted, this city will make it. The city's parks, which nourish the people with beauty and tranquil ease, are peopled nearly every day of Sydney's sun-filled years. There are seen the gentler, relaxed faces of the people as they escape from work, or from shopping, or just sit during the lunch hour. Eating al fresco has a relish of its own and all the endless variety of human faces to observe. A lunchtime concert, perhaps? How do the people react? Preoccupied or idle, unconscious of their fellows. If the proper study of mankind is man, the park is an ideal classroom for studying humanity. For here is revealed much of its frailty and good-heartedness, its yearning, waywardness, joy, aloneness and dignity, as if men were alone in a garden and unobserved. The city's parks also meet the needs of those who seek their relaxation in competing with their fellow man. The footsore and the weary who seek respite from the city's midday tempo or those nimble-footed office workers who devote their lunch hour to the pursuit of sport. Both thank the city's far-seeing founding fathers who preserved these green oases for posterity. More than 2,000 ships plying from every port in the world enter and leave Sydney Harbour each year. Built around one of the world's most beautiful harbours is one of the world's great seaports. The harbour, with an area of about 21 square miles, has about 12 miles of wharves. The authorities are constantly improving and adding to the port's facilities, remodelling its wharfage, building bigger cargo stores and erecting modern gear. The overseas passenger terminal at Sydney Cove accommodates the largest liners. This mural within the terminal depicts a very different scene. The raw land which British Captain Arthur Phillip and his first fleet settlers saw when they dropped anchor in this same Sydney Cove in January 1788 and founded the Australian nation. A few miles away at Mascot on the shores of Botany Bay, from all points of the compass and to the most distant parts of the earth, 
Jet airliners make landfall and scream into the blue skies from the city's international airport, which handles about two million passengers each year. The Public Library, headquarters of a library service for the whole state of New South Wales, on which more than a million and a half in money is spent annually. The library, and especially its renowned Mitchell Wing, devoted to Australian history, will tell the interested or the curious much about the city's past. Sydney in 1900, when the city achieved a population of half a million people. By 1926, it had grown to a million people. 19 years later, in 1945, a million and a half. And today, the big city has a population of 2.3 million people. The 2,300,000 people are adding to their city constantly. In its heart, there is scarcely a street without some building activity. Modernizations, additions, new tall buildings. Tear into it, knock it down, and build something new and bigger. These have been fat years for a multiplying calling, the demolishers, the wreckers. Tear down and rebuild. Raise to raise. Up, up, up. More office space for more office workers climbing to breathtaking views over the panorama of city concrete, parks and harbour waters. Building plans approved for construction in the city of Sydney were valued at 18 million pounds or 36 million dollars five years ago. In the latest year, approvals totaled 26 million pounds or 52 million dollars. This is the city the people have built, past and present generations of builders. The new, the old. Fine, gracious old buildings dotted about among the concrete canyons and next door the new and functional. the city's oldest school and early colonial church, severe bank. So it goes, tradition and modernity, mellowness and necessity, the contrast of pulsing city. Here another sort of grand vision is becoming a reality. In the city's commercial center, a whole area of older buildings was demolished to make way for a bold imaginative project. Private enterprise capital and energy are erecting a complex of new city buildings, the Australia Square development. From the demolitions will grow its centrepiece, a tower of offices, the tallest construction in Sydney and tallest in the Southern Hemisphere. And here a rebirth for one of Sydney's oldest areas. Known as the Rocks because of its topographical features, it straddles the promontory on which the southern approaches of the Harbour Bridge stand. In early days, a gallows stood on the heights, and at the close of the last century, the rocks was infested by ruffianly pushers, or gangs. The rocks has long been a backwater, picturesque here and there, but outmoded. All this is to be swept away and replaced by a well-conceived group of office buildings, modern apartments, and skyscraper hotel, rearing above the city's doorway and birthplace, Sydney Cove. At the end of World War II, in common with all great cities, Sydney had a pressing need for more housing, for young married couples and for the thousands of new settlers arriving from Britain and Europe. The New South Wales government, in partnership with private enterprise, embarked on a huge program of housing construction. Between them, they lifted enormously the number of Sydney's dwellings, but the need persists. 
Sydney's people live in towers of home units, in smart modern cottages, or in fine elaborate mansions. They will never stop building. Children at primary and secondary schools throughout New South Wales now number more than three quarters of a million. The tremendous population growth in the past 20 years put enormous strains on the education system, as it did on all public services. The state's annual education budget has risen to 20 times the 5.5 million pounds, or 11 million dollars, spent in 1942. And since the marriage rate is high, the pressure is not likely to slacken. The University of Sydney, where much modern architecture contrasts with splendid old buildings, is one of two universities which the city possesses, and Sydney is about to build a third university. Sydney is very nearly an island. Highway engineers in the state's main roads department, who labour to improve the channels for traffic, run up against water everywhere they turn. On the western edge of the inner city, a new pre-stressed concrete bridge has been built, a six-lane road 1,600 feet long, atop the longest arch of its kind attempted anywhere in the world. Beyond it, another big new bridge. Between lies a third stretch of water, which the engineers must bridge before they can proceed with an urgently needed expressway. There is the big metropolis of Sydney, stretching away westward to the foothills of the world-famed Blue Mountains and northward to the Hawkesbury River and Broken Bay. Through it will sweep expressways to the west and to the north. But here, on the other side of the city, is the first completed section of a major outlet to its eastern suburbs. This has reduced traffic congestion significantly. First dividend from a heavy expressways investment that will consume 26 million pounds or 52 million dollars in the next six years. From here, the major eastern artery will sweep through this close-built legacy from the past. On Benelong Point is rising what Sydney believes will become one of the great opera houses of the world. This far-sighted addition to the city actually is more than an opera house. It is a centre for the various performing arts. Its great auditorium is designed for symphony concerts and big popular entertainments as well as opera productions. It includes a second large theatre for stage plays and lesser halls for concert recitals, smaller scale plays or reviews, dance recitals, film screenings and so on. As the softening cloak of nightfall lowers upon the city, numbers of its millions of people devote themselves to disproving that the night cometh when no man can work. The city takes on a new aspect. The multi-coloured signs wink out their messages and beckon back to the city's heart those who wish to celebrate, to entertain or be entertained. For them there is a wealth of pleasures. Food, dancing, good company, cabaret or the best in music, interpreted by accomplished musicians. This is the city the people of Sydney have built in so short a time. A great city, where the first settlers built rude dwellings less than 200 years ago. A thriving commercial city, busy, vigorous and ever-changing in its outlines. A down-to-earth practical city, but resplendent nevertheless. Spreading on the velvet dark of night, a wonderland of stars. <laughs> 